and Seth Hendy. The panelists will examine the design of several complex medical devices and point out why their designs create a greater challenges, challenge for processing staff. They will review damage that may occur to these devices and quality processing steps that can be implemented to improve patient and staff member safety. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Healthmark. Healthmark Industries' mission is to continue to innovate, continue to support, and continue to serve the healthcare provider industry and support services that make it possible to deliver quality healthcare. For more information, please visit hmark.com. A few announcements before we get started. We would like to wish a very happy HTM week to all of you in the field of HTM. Our biomedical equipment technicians, clinical engineers, and other members of the healthcare technology management family, thank you for your dedication to patient care through the support of healthcare technology. To celebrate, we have two contests this week. Please visit the handout section of the GoToWebinar dashboard for all of the details. Additionally, please join us for continuing education, networking, and vendor engagement opportunities at our upcoming HTM Mixers over the next few months. Tech Nation will be in Milwaukee on July 14th and 15th and in Kansas City on September 9th and 10th. Please visit htmmixer.com for details, registration, and our steps to a safe and clean meeting environment. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win one of our new Webinar Wednesday t-shirts by answering the following question. In what year was Healthmark Industries founded? You can answer the question by visiting our sponsor's website and using the questions feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. We'll have more details on this at the end of today's webinar. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our presenters today are Jahan Azizi, Kevin Anderson, and Seth Hendy. Jahan, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Jennifer, and again, uh, happy HTM or Biomed Week for our uh, old timer that we used to call it Biomed, but HTM, yes, is a, um, again, this is a great week for us, and thank you for mentioning that. So I'm Jahan Azizi, I'm a, a biomedical engineering, uh, certified biomedical technician, and I work at Healthmark for uh, almost two years now. So, Seth? Thanks, Jahan, and thank you. You're, you're going to see why Jahan is HTM when he talks about some of these devices that we're talking about, the way that they have to understand things, so it's going to be great. My name is Seth Hendy. I have been working for Healthmark for uh, more than two years now. Um, gr great, great team to be a part of, and we keep adding uh, new great people like Jahan and Kevin. So I I'm looking forward to this. And my name is Kevin Anderson. I'll be picking up uh, the third leg of this presentation. Uh, I've been with Healthmark for about a year and a half now, just over that, and my background was operating room nursing and scrubbing, and also I managed sterile processing. So I had to deal with a lot of the things that you all are dealing with, whether on the user end in the operating room or even on the management side and SPD of processing these complex devices. So really looking forward to getting into this one with you guys. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, our talks today is, is going to be our building quality into complex instrument testing. I'm sure as a CSPD, you have been called into the operating room to, and 
being called that there's an issue with the quality or there were some debris on the instrument or some issue. Uh, but I think uh, the whole idea of the quality is that what can you do to prevent those trips or call to the operating room? So let's look at the objective for today. So uh, as Kevin mentioned that it's going to be three section, I'm going to re review basic anatomy of the complex medical devices. Then Seth is going to talk about identify the key points where damage can occur and really how a strategy to mitigate those issues. And uh, Kevin is going to discuss the quality management process that will help improve the patient outcome and the staff safety. So let's look at that. So I'm going to review the several components that we talked about. Which, you know, sometimes you say that uh, the surgical instrument would be simple. You know, these are the vintage that, you know, you have. Uh, the amputation kit that you see here, uh, that's all it, it took to, to get that. But we're no longer in that. We are in an era of uh, basic minimum invasive uh, surgeries or MIS. And as you know, that has been growing rapidly. I mean, we're looking at the forecast for uh, 2025, it's going to be in north of $21 billion. So as you see that the growth is rapid and uh, is non-stoppable. So that uh, MIS has been bringing, obviously, a great procedure and outcome for the patient. However, it's going to bring a lot of instrument to the operating room and head back to the CSPD. When I used to work at University of Michigan, they were processing 40,000 items a day. So once you have these high volume, complex devices, and we look at some of them, that's what it takes. And we have we found out some of the IFUs have not been truly validated for all the aspect of that. It's going to create some issues. So what we're going to do, look at some samples of what we have and try to see what the root causes are, what can we do to medicate that. So again, when I was at University of Michigan, uh, we had an issue, as you know, with the shaver. <clears throat> And while we were going through that, and we found out that wasn't really the only issue, it was one that bubbled up due to the cross-contamination in one of the uh, hospitals in Texas. And during my conversation with the SPD and uh, mostly OR staff, we found out these are the list of items that they call them problematic. And what's interesting that I said that why why do you call them problematic or why did you mention this i said that because either we got, got called into the operating room to look at these or we had an incident or issue that we had to deal with so the list i'm sure it varies per institution per area how you do that the complexity the, the volume of the surgery that you do do you have to turn the, those around quickly so those are some of the items that we looked at i'm going to talk about a couple of them and I hope as we move forward, we look at some other one that the complex problem. I'm starting with Shaver, not because, you know, with the manufacturer name. Uh, indeed, uh, as you know, that the Shaver is a really, really expensive uh, high speed drill. And most of them are working at FDA. They were substantially equivalent to the other ones. So, for example, if Smith and Nephew or Dynac or uh, even Medtronic came up with a new device, they would go back to FDA so that this is substantially equivalent to the, for example, the striker. So in a sense that the technology inside of these should operate the same basic principle as a high speed drill. So if you see I'm missing some of those is not the intention, one is better than the other, or one is gonna get cleaner or uh, the, the other, probably that's not the case. So again, arthroscopic shaver striker, it was because it was involved in an incident in Texas. And FDA asked uh, most of the hospital to take a look inside them. And uh, I was more proactive and I received a grant from FDA to kind of run a whole year program to see what it is. Is it the issue with uh, user? Is it issue with the design? because FDA was receiving mixed messages from manufacturers that the users are not following the instruction for use. So during that time, uh, I looked at the instruction for use, and they were recommending really using one brush to 
clean that one brush appropriate size didn't have really the size of the brush and when i looked at that and as you see that uh Sad was mentioning that we, as a biomedical engineering or BMETs or HTM, we look at things a little different. We said that why is not working or why can I clean this? So obviously, you know, trying to find out what it is since you cannot really use this under MRI or CT to see what is inside them. So you take a hacksaw and uh, you cut them to pieces, and this is what you see. And a brand new one of these is a ten thousand dollars. So. Uh, you don't want to cut all yours, but we have one example for you that, that is here. So as you see here, that they were asking to use one brush to clean all these different diameter internal lumen. So I wonder why one brush wouldn't work. And then if you look at this, you had this shaft that holds a disposable uh, for shaving the, the tissue and the stuff inside the joint, which is a great procedure that is going to impede you from going cleaning all these areas. And as you look at, as I said, it's like more like three, four different sections. So once they corrected the IFU, not all of them, again, some of the manufacturers are more proactive and some of them still are lacking by about 10 years or so because this issue came out in uh, 2009, 2010, actually we move into a decade. So a decade later, some of the manufacturer hasn't really updated their IFU that you need more than one brush size to do that. As you're looking at this, uh, we used to have a quiz question, how many brushes do you need to clean a shaver? Or the answer would be four or five different brush sizes and type to be able to, to appropriately clean this shaver. And then furthermore, lady which is not included in the IFU, I haven't seen any other IFU, that there's a potential for, because there's O-rings here, that the leak goes inside the shaver's mechanism, get hot and the debris and bio burden goes inside. So if you don't want to cut one, you can have a uh, Allen wrench and you can open some of these. This is a shaver, wasn't really clean looking, but as you see here, this area, this is actually where that suction uh, irrigator get attached to it. And you see that over time, this wasn't uh, visible with naked eye or even with anything else because it was actually between the screws. So as you see that this debris and, uh, could dislodge and go in. So if you look at that, there's a lot of O-rings and we know that O-rings over time with the heat, temperature and chemical, they will probably deteriorate. Again, if you can open them, you see inside those nice clean sh uh, shavers that there are some debris underneath those uh, area that the leak can go inside them. So here's the O-ring that something happened to it and there's obviously fluid invasion here. And here you see that uh, it rusted. So if the rust obviously go on electrical component would get damaged and I'm sure one of the quick way of knowing that it, the handle gets really hot because you, you're creating a lot of resistance inside that handpiece and it could get hot, it could even cause burn and an injury to the user and to the patient. So here what we have a nice clean, uh, so we move into flexible endoscope. As you see that they're really nice and clean on the outside, you know, uh, black, shiny objects all over. Then they, usually they give you this really nice di diagram that, uh, that what was going on inside this. So you have the biopsy valve that hooks up to the basically suction areas. And then you have the air and water that goes through the pump and goes through that area. As you see, that looks like pretty easy to follow. But again, as a biomed, once you open them up, those area of blue and green and stuff, you see that there are a lot of differences here that you have about 90 degree angles here. So there's no way that you can send a brush and be able to clean all those. And another thing with the physics of brushing, once you hit an area, a curve, the brush usually move to one side. So you probably would scraping only the top portion of the inside the channel. And on this photo that's, that you see, 
This is due to the fluid invasion. For example, maybe there was a leak inside the endoscope and over time the fluid got in. And again, we uh, both sat and uh, we'll tell you and Kevin that what's going on, why leak got inside that, uh, the, sh the scope. And here, for example, damage that you see by looking at the, you don't have to destroy this by looking with a flexible inspection scope, and you will see that there are damages inside this, this scope. Rigid scope is the other item that uh, we've been having some issue with it. So what it is that you obviously have a distal tip here, you have the proximal, and then you have the eyepiece and the area that actually you attach the light core to it. So what happened is that, again, on the outside, you see they, they're pretty nice and clean that you can actually, you know, uh, see attached the light source to it, see the prism and the stuff. But once you look inside it again, you have a lot of glasses here, glass rods that allows the, the light reflection to, to go to a different direction. Once, if you drop these up or hit something that these glass rod would break. And once it break, you're gonna cause some uh, basically distorted image of the device that, or the patient. So here, for example, on the uh, flexible light fiber optic light source, as you see, some of these could uh, break and then you have black dots on the outside of that. So this is basically what is inside rigid scope and that the issues that you could have with it, you could have with broken glasses or uh, glass light fiber optic that could get damaged. The other one is the light cord. The light cord we have, uh, the issues obviously with that is, obviously you need to transfer light from the light source to the rigid scope and make sure that you have adequate light. So, and there are a variety of up there and hopefully that, you know, every hospital you see that you have a different manufacturer for the uh, surgical instrument. So you have different light cores, you have different adapters that you, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate adapters and what have you in it. But again, as you saw from the previous photo, the, the fiber optic, the glass, and when uh, they get burned, you're gonna have some damaged fiber optic and reducing the light source to the end, end of the cord. And usually they say that if you have about 80% uh, 80, 80 light uh, is good, but anything below that, you need to probably replace uh, the light source. On the electrical cord and cables, uh, obviously most of the laparoscopic uh, surgical instruments, that either you have bipolar or monopolar cords. And those, uh, you're looking at some of their IFUs and they're not really a consistent approach to how you sterilize them and how many times. We saw some as 10, 15, 20 times. Some, they really didn't have a numbers on them. And some, I guess, people assume that they're good forever. And we found out that uh, that's not the case. If, if you have, for example, in this case, this institution had, for example, that here's a 20 time. That means this uh, cable was reprocessed 20 times and it's time to basically pitch them. Actually, this was a bucket that was ready to, to go out and recycle or dispose of because they were all at the 20. But if you don't have a system that you can keep track of these items, how do you know that you've been using them 10 times or, or 100 times? So looking inside the cable and the stuff, and really for anything insulator, you have the, the insulation sheet, then you have the uh, some kind of armor to protect from the stretching of the cable. Uh, then you have, again, double insulation and you have the conductor. We've been talking about the protective insulation. However, there are some reports of uh, surgical fires or near misses that, that you have that the actual conductors of those wires were getting damaged. So the conductors were breaking over time. And then once you get to the end of the life, you have one or two, two of these strands, uh, then all of, a, all of a sudden it breaks or carries too much electricity and you get a big puff and the smoke coming at the end of that, that process. 
one of the things is always uh, it, it's never going to happen to me item that I'm I'm doing doing it right, but I strongly recommend that you look at the mod database. That's FDA mod database. The user and facilities are supposed to report to this, and this is an example of what what was in that and we're talking about. Obviously, the, the recalls out there. In this case, for example. Uh, this is a recall number that happened in 2018, and the recall number is 1952. He said there's a potential for court to spark and to cause fire. So the manufacturer decided to, to recall this. But if you look at the mod reports, you will see that some of them, actually, they are there, they're near misses. For example, in this case, that he said that during laparoscopic uh, colostomy, the bovi, and for some of our biomed, uh, listening that the bovi obviously is supposed to refer to electrosurgical you know, ESU, but uh, still the name of the bovi is sticks, and even if they're using uh, somebody else, they still call it bovi. Bovi was not working well. The power was increased from 35 to 40. Spark came from the cord where it was attached to the machine. And obviously, you know, that uh, one of the issue was that got to the point that there were not enough uh, conductors at the end of it, the last couple of them that cause a lot of energy going through a couple wire and spark and fall on the floor. In this case, they were lucky because, as you know, that with the uh, patient laying on the on the table, that uh, with the oxygen rich environment, that's basically as a kindling you got uh, cause operating fire. So this th this institution was lucky and didn't have the operating fire. But the point the after that, that kind of a little disappointed as a biomed or as an FDA that said we checked the machine and the machine checked out okay. Versus I think better approach would be that why that cord failed and do we have, how many of them do we have in the hospital? Maybe I need to go check for the continuity and if there, there are similar issues happening. But in that case, uh, that was a quick, check the machine is okay, let's put it back in use. So the next section is going to be covered by Seth. Go ahead, Seth. Thanks, John. So what I'm going to try to do right now is go through those, those same complex instruments that John had talked about and identify some key points where damage occurs and then talk a little prevention strategies. And, and if you need to know, all three of these pictures are examples of where damage occurs, right? And, and we're gonna do some more of that as we go through. Next slide, John. We started with shavers, so let's let's continue with shavers. That seal, that hermetic seal that, that Jahan was talking about is really there to protect the electronical components. Um, this is interesting to me because that's all we were ever told from the operating room. I worked in the SPD and you know, we would probably get 12 to 15 hand pieces of, of their, they were not all shavers, but would just come down on a repair tag from the OR that said hot. And we used to go, all right, well, I wonder what makes it hot, but okay, it's it's hot, it says it's broken, we'll, we'll send it out. Um, and learning more about this, that's what you find out. If, if we start having problems, it's really starting to build up resistance, as Jahan said, and that's how, uh, if those seals are compromised, then the electronics get compromised, and if the electronics get compromised, that is a way that they could be hot. It's not the only one, but, uh, also, as Jahan mentioned, what, what's a bit of a problem with these? Um, the IFUs may not render a clean device, and that's, you know, that's tough because we rely on them. Uh, we've been asking for decades now, give me the IFU, please don't bring something into my facility without an IFU. The IFU comes, you follow it, and yet we find out that there's very difficult to reach areas and that multiple brushes really are required if you ever have any chance of getting this clean. And if you don't have those, even you know meticulously following an IFU doesn't necessarily uh, result in a clean device and that's, that's very difficult. Uh, what did the FDA have to do to follow up with that? They said, okay, well, look, we, we need to have a recommendation for internal inspections. And so uh, we show it sometimes, um, uh, the, the statement that the FDA put out, uh, and they even talked about using 
um, a rigid little rhinoscope, a three millimeter uh, rigid scope, because uh, when this was first identified, somebody said, well, hey, I think I've got a, a rhinoscope that might fit. I wonder what's down here. And then they started to look at the barrel section, which you can't, <clears throat> excuse me, which you cannot visualize without a tool like that. Without a without a flexible inspection scope or without a uh, a rigid little uh, endoscope, we're not Superman. We don't have X-ray vision. We can't see. I do want to point out though that cleaning verification is another tool that you can use. So it doesn't always have to be visual. But the FDA did come out and say you've got to do something. We've asked the manufacturers to reevaluate their IFUs. But from a user perspective, from a person on the ground trying to clean this, you've got to do something to ensure that these are clean. Next slide. And here's what we see. And you can see that, that picture in the top left moving, that's the barrel section. And look at the piece of meniscus that's left in there, right? That's the piece that we cannot see uh, with, without uh, looking inside. And the picture on the bottom does the same thing. These are these are just images of different different parts of the shaver. And that one right there that Jahan is highlighting on the bottom, that's the fork area where he said, hey, don't these two little pins sticking out actually stop us from reaching the bottom? Yes, they do. And then I just wanted you to see on top, uh, you know, even when you're looking with something, um, uh, you, what looks like rust, up a little higher, John, the next picture up. That even visualizing, you might say, maybe that's rust. Well, actually, when we put a, a, a protein check down there, that comes out positive for protein. So that is where, as I said, cleaning verification is also a way uh, to, to do that and to look. But that's really the point. If you've got shavers, you have to be looking somehow and with some method, or, or you're probably going to be missing something. Next slide. Now we'll switch, just as Jahan did, we'll switch to, to flexible endoscopes. Guess what? They're also hermetically sealed. They have electronical components, and then they have uh, areas that are not accessible for cleaning that if the seal is broken, the electronics can be damaged. And then it's not just, it's not just we say fluid, and most people say, oh, water can get in there. Actually, blood and other things are also fluid. So, so bio burden and contaminants can get in there. Um, and, and these are great devices for what they do. We, we know that they, they have to be around or else uh, with things like duodoscopes, the FDA would have told them that they have to pull them off the market. But what did they say? The benefits of using this device outweigh the risks. What we have to do is be aware of the risks. Risks are the outer sheaths can be damaged. It, it does not take a whole lot. The inner sheaths, uh, the inner channels can have holes and gouges and can experience damage. And then, of course, there can be damage uh, to the seals in the lens, the body, and the control head. So remember, when you're doing your leak testing, you're not only checking uh, for the, the distal tip, right, and the deflection. You're actually, when you're moving it through its whole range, you're actually checking the dials as well because those are sealed as well. Other things that can happen, uh, you know, the angulation can become loose. So some now come with a chart where you say, okay, it should go all the way this way, but it should only go that far that way. And you should know what the range of deflection is because it's gotta be, uh, it still has to be functional on all those and, and, and not being good one way or another is gonna stop it from being used right. Uh, the Teflon inner channels uh, can be damaged in other ways too, which is improper instrument use. And so if, if a biopsy forcep comes back while it's open, it can actually shred little pieces of that in, inner channel. And then of course, kinks and restrictions. So when someone says, don't coil your large endoscope smaller than a basketball or a soccer ball, or something like that, uh, it's because it creates what you see on the left. Jahan had showed a picture, but here's another one. And, and so in that pinch point, there's now debris collecting on it because that's just a speed bump to a cleaning brush. And that doesn't necessarily uh, create a leaking scope, right? So your scope is passing a leak test. And if you're not doing internal inspections, you're thinking this scope is getting clean, right? And that's that part is just holding on to debris. And then external damage 
might not be easily to easy to visualize either and that's the thing that we're finding out with that as Jahan said they look very nice on the outside so sometimes pinpointing very small defects in what looks like a mile uh, worth of black tubing becomes very difficult so uh, enhancing your inspection is always good next slide here's just some of the stuff we we thought I, I couldn't help but put this picture in on the right because how many times have you seen a control head like that leak? Now, I've seen it in many other places, but that's actually one of the only times I've seen it down at that end. So if you ever catch someone in their water bath looking at just the distal tip of a, of a scope during a leak test, tell them that it's the it really is the entire thing. And here's just some things that through magnification, we've come a lot closer. If you tried to look between the dials uh, or if you tried to look at the tip of an endoscope, you know the tip of that um, endoscope is not, is not as big around as my pinky. And so finding that little black smudge of maybe glue that's come out, maybe bio burden, we're not sure what it is, but finding it at this level is hard. Finding it when we make it that big around, you say, well, how could anyone miss that? Well, I'm telling you, I've looked at these in facilities and it's not that easy to see until we put it under magnification. Now, here's what most of us can't do. And this middle picture is internal boroscopic, microscopic boroscopic inspection. And so when that happens, you're actually seeing grooves in the Teflon. And here's the scary part. They put some, some dye in there and these little blue specks are microbial contamination. Right, so when the FDA says you should be doing some kind of contamination testing, are you checking for gram negative bacteria and things like that? This is why, that's how they live inside an endoscope even when you're cleaning it and trying to clean it properly and disinfecting it. Next slide. Let's talk about rigid scopes now. Uh, key points, of course, damage. Uh, it happens to the optics, uh, bending the shaft, and it can misalign things, it can chip and, and have failures. And I've seen them used sort of as a pry bar. You know, it, they're into a port and they can't quite see where they want. And they start putting some leverage on it. That's very tough on a rigid scope. Uh, the light posts can get cross-threaded and have issues. Uh, the distal tip sadly can come into contact with other devices. And we had it on our very first slide of objectives. And that was one that a shaver had nipped off the tip of that, uh, of that rigid endoscope. And it can totally happen. I will tell a quick anecdotal story about improper handling. I watched someone in an SPD with a brand new scope in their hand reach over like this and to hand it to someone and look away and the person who was supposed to be taking it had their hand out and looked away and that scope went right to the ground. So a brand new scope hit the ground and the view was black as you can imagine. And so improper handling can be from all over. Some of it's careless, some of it's a little negligent. It really doesn't matter, it's tough. Here's what we get though. Since there's no moving parts in a rigid scope, most of it's always to do with the view. And so if you're not looking and you're not making sure that you're checking that and you're thinking, well, the OR is going to tell me if they couldn't see or whatever, you're, you're missing out because you think it's simple and you're not really focusing in on the main job of this item. Next slide. Here's just a few kind of things, you know, what happens, what does damage look like? Well, it looks like cloudiness in the picture. It looks like a blurry picture. Uh, sometimes you can see visual debris you know, water stains, water marks. Well, again, these lenses are sealed. That could be a sign of fluid invasion into that uh, scope. And then, then it's starting to show up on the lenses and then a dim picture. Now here's the real problem. And Kevin's gonna talk about this, is putting this up to your eye, which is in most IFUs that you should be at least visualizing writing on a piece of paper, let's say, uh, to, to be looking for a clear image. Is that really how they're used in the OR? You know, they're working with light, they're working with a video image, and it's very rare that you ever see a doc put his eye up to the eyepiece of a rigid endoscope. And so some of those checks you have to think to yourself, are, the, are all the checks that we're doing representative of how this is really used? Maybe, maybe not. So next slide. Here's just some things to look at when we talk about light fibers, because this becomes a little bit difficult. 
Um, I, I really wish they could give you something better than more than 20%. So as Jahan said, 80% or up is good. Um, when you have individual round bundles, you can almost count them. But the one on the bottom left there, that becomes tough. If you have to think about that as a whole pie, the little black piece that's about one o'clock, is, is that 20% of my pie? Well, not quite. When does it get to be? So the problem is it's a little tough. But once you get there, you're already at dim, low resolution, um, and then uh, concentrated damage could cloud the whole image. And this is when, in the operating room, they're turning that light source up to 11, right? They've got it on its highest setting because they say, I can't see anything through this scope. There isn't enough light going on. What's going on? And then the cord itself can be damaged or get hot that way. This is just a quick little thing from the IFU. If you're checking it manually, you're still holding it up. So that's, as I say, that's very tough. Is that how they're using them in the operating room is to hold it up to a low light and see what comes through? Not necessarily. You were okay, John. That was okay. Go ahead and click ahead. Uh, light cords, let's talk about the key points. No, now backward. There you go. Um, so what do we get for light cords? Well, we get fiber optic fiber breakage that's again those black dots uh there can be damage this you know really all the way through but there are lenses at the proximal and distal ends so not only the fibers that run through the whole thing that can be broken you do have specific pieces on both ends um, the protective covering can become an issue and then fluid gets in there and you can't clean it and it's causing damage so that's two things and then the myriad of adapters you know if you have um, you know, if you have a scope that has uh, an inner adapter and an outer, and somebody says, you know, I don't need that little inner one, really, you should take a look at the IFU because actually, um, you may. These things go together, and then depending on the light source that they have up in the operating room, they may need that inner one to connect to it, depending on what it is. So please don't, you know, like don't shortchange the adapters or throw on whichever one you've got because they may get it in the OR and it may not hook up. It may not hook up to the light source or it may not hook up to the uh, to the scope. Next slide. How do they get damaged? I said, you know, this was the, the picture. Uh, this is a person uh, or, or a facility, I'm sorry, that doesn't care about a lot of their equipment. They're okay that these light cords get messed up. They're pretty sure that that shaver isn't a problem because they've hooked that into a bath. Of, you know, this is not how we protect complex, delicate and expensive instruments. And really, why is that? Well, broken fibers will appear as black spots. Well, having that shaver sit on top of there, that is a way to break fibers. Um, and then you also are wanting to check the exterior. And as I say again, there, there are some trocars uh, and ports in here. So those things are actually meant to poke skin and to, you know, so do you think that they could make, do damage to a light cord? They absolutely could. Uh, and you can't make this stuff up. We don't stage a lot of these pictures. We just find them and say, Okay, this is this is a problem waiting to happen. Next slide. Here's what Jahan was talking about. Um, and and cords have two things. They have external coating integrity, and then they have internal fiber continuity. So right, what I've got going left and right are ways of checking the external coatings integrity. Um, the, you know, this is, and you'll see that little red light go off right there, right? That shows a leak in that cord. Uh, and actually, if we got in super close, there's a little spark that goes off there, right? So that shows you, okay, wait a minute, the outside of this cord has been damaged. But what Jahan was talking about was the middle picture. Now, someone says, this thing isn't working the way I want. And again, what's, what's their option in the OR? What do they think their best option is? just grab that dial and turn it to 11. Well, when enough internal fibers or enough internal continuity is damaged, those last fibers will not handle the, the, uh, the electrosurgical unit on 11. They can't take it, they burn, and, and there they go. And the, the real question is a fire. Next slide. 
That's why I put this here, right? Jahan talked about it. The, this is the fire triangle. So you have an ignition source. Well, a damaged light cord is an ignition source. You've got fuel, uh, which is sadly the people that are in the room, the drapes, you you name it, but anything that's there that will burn. And then you have your oxidizers. And we do, we've got an, a very oxygen rich environment going on. So any of these two shavers that you are, on, uh, these two cords that you would see on the left, if in the wrong position and, and the heat from that lasts long enough, these are a source of fire for sure. Next slide. This, I just had, we had to put it in there because it's new, right? There was four new amendments that came out in 2021 to ST79 and amendment two uh, was about inspecting that it's finally insulated surgical devices have finally gotten their own spot. And so, uh, this is where we need to be uh, instruments intended for use with electrical current should be tested for integrity each time it is processed. Think about that. That is your cords. That is your, uh, your laparoscopic instruments. That's your bipolars. Those are all EU, uh, ESU devices and they're all electrical devices and they all need to be checked each time. Now, Kevin is going to talk to us about adding some quality to our inspections. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, so let's get into this third objective, discussing quality management processes that will help improve patient outcomes and staff safety when working with these complex medical devices. And uh, onto this next slide, we are going to follow that same sort of uh, flow that Jahan started for us. So let's get back to that shaver. Um, we discussed in the beginning uh, with Jahan and he showed those pictures of fluid and contaminants getting under the seals and into these hidden areas of these shaver devices. This is one of those devices that, um, you know, as a, as a former OR nurse, we use them all the time and sometimes things do go wrong with them and you have no idea what's going on uh, or why. Uh, so there are simple things that we can do. And in this picture, you see the cap inside the end of that uh, shaver hand piece. Uh, you see a pump hooked up to it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that on the next slide. But this is a very simple uh, product that you can use to test those seals, right? You're just going to put that cap inside the end. Of course, there's going to be different types of caps for different shavers and all of that good stuff uh, so that you have what you need. And then you're going to hook up that pump. Uh, right up to where you would normally hook the suction tubing on the shaver. And then as everything is completely set up, you can then squeeze the bulb, add some pressure uh, to the inside of that shaver, and you're going to see uh, a loss in pressure if there is a leak. And if you're confused about it, whether or not it's actually leaking, you could even submerge it underwater and observe it uh, while you have pressure applied and see if there's any um, uh, bubbles escaping similar to an endoscopic uh, leak test. And then of course with shavers, uh, Jahan touched on this earlier, right? When it comes to quality management, it's very important that you have the right tools for the job. So hopefully by now uh, we've done a good job of showing you how uh, these particular devices, they need more than that one brush. and so often we go into departments and we just see a mess of brushes and people just use what they have available. There's no, you know, uh, hey, this is the brush pack for our shaver hand pieces. We go and we grab this every time we have to process a shaver. Why don't we do that? Why don't we have packs? Like we have case carts assembled for very specific procedures, right? For very specific surgeons. Why don't we have that? for our devices in decontam, right? Well, we could easily have that. Look how these brushes work in those cross-section views. And this is just three different uh, ends of brushes, right? You have that first fat one that gets all those different wider diameters. And then as you move to the middle, you have the one that gets down into that drive fork area that we talked about earlier. And then you move over to the right and you see that one that fits nicely down that channel. but there's that one end at the end of the channel that is slightly wider too. So you might even need another channel brush there. So 
again, going back to what Jahan said in the beginning, four or five brushes for that shaver, is that what you're using? Because that's really what we need, right? And then moving on to the flexible endoscopes. Oh my gosh, you know, we have to talk a little bit about prevention when it comes to quality management. Um, flexible scopes are prime candidate for meticulous attention to detail when it comes to prevention. And one thing that I don't get is why do we continue to transport $30,000 and up uh, in terms of cost endoscopes in a baggie? Like I get that they're cheap and they're easy, low maintenance, all of that. Uh, the problem is there's virtually no way to protect these expensive assets inside of that bag, right? it's bound to get overcoiled or banged up or damaged when we transport it. Hey, we're, we're on a mission. We are trying to turn that room over. We're setting scopes down. We're piling them up in the uh, decontam room, whatever it is. And that baggie is not going to uh, provide any protection. So let's get that part right. Let's invest in those correct transport trays and allow for uh, proper coiling and all of that. All right. So, what is the next step that is so critical is that leak test that we talked about earlier. Um, both Jahan and Seth touched on this. But what can we do with our leak tester? So often we get a leak tester and we kind of just have blind faith that it's always working. The IFU, admittedly, in my mind, doesn't really help us very much because it tells us to turn it on, push the pin, listen for a whoosh. This isn't a very good process. I remember having a uh, uh, endoscope repair facility come in and audit our process, and they were asking us, how do we check this leak tester to know if it's working? It should have a gauge on it to measure PSI, right? And our HTM partners, being as good as they were, they they fabricated their own PSI tester, but they embedded it right into the cord and uh, the manufacturer did not like that. So luckily there are devices like you see here in the picture. Uh, it's a leak tester tester. And what it does is it can help measure the amount of air pressure coming out of the leak tester itself. And then again, after the, the air is pushed through that cord that hooks up to your endoscope, both components are extremely important, right? Having low pressure reach your endoscope is going to help you to miss potential leaks and potential dangers and lead to possible infection control issues. So let's make sure we're checking that leak tester. Well, similarly to the shaver uh, with uh, flexible endoscopes, we need to make sure we have our tools, right? Those brushes, again, you have different openings, different diameters. You need several different brushes, not a one size fits all for every endoscope, every model, every opening, right? We need to have our little kit set aside. What brushes do we need for each model? Have them ready to go, know what we're doing and have those basic things down. And then are we gonna maybe think about putting some cleaning verification into our process? This is really important because we could even be following the IFU. Maybe we have a bore scope uh, to inspect these uh, devices, but maybe we don't. And if we don't, this cleaning verification tool that we can implement after our manual cleaning procedure could potentially identify problems with our cleaning process. Many times failures in a cleaning verification test, uh, the, the users end up finding out that their endoscope was damaged. So these cleaning verification tests are very valuable to implement in your process. Uh, so rigid endoscopes. We talked about rigid endoscopes earlier. Hopefully you're not doing the, uh, this like you see in the top pictures. Uh, but again, this is to Seth's point, we don't stage this stuff. This is stuff that we find out in the field. Uh, rigid endoscopes, again, thousands of dollars worth of assets here just kind of thrown into trays kind of haphazardly and then sent on their way. Uh, not a good idea if you're an OR tech or nurse or a surgeon and you expect to have a nice working uh, rigid endoscope for your case that's coming up. So let us implement something that looks like what we saw on the bottom there. Put the tray 
uh, together, use tip protection if you need it, and protect those endoscopes. Now, we want to inspect these scopes too. This is a nice quality check that we can implement in our prep and pack station um, that maybe you don't know that it, it's available to you. This is something that when I first started in SPD, one of the things that we could do or had was an old um, endoscopy tower where we could actually hook up our devices and test them. That quickly got obsolete and we no longer had the ability to do that. Well, as you see from the pictures that Seth shared and then the ones you see right now, we know that between the care and handling and the bumps and bruises these things take, they do break. And sometimes, it, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not even taking the time to look at what you're looking at on the picture here. We just take the scope, we put it in the container, wrap it and send it on its way. Well, that's not okay because I'm gonna tell you in the OR, it is obviously a time drain if that stuff happens because we can't catch it in the OR until the sterile drapes are applied and we're trying to do surgery. That is not the time to do a quality check. Uh, so what can you do? You can use a device like you see here, right? And when you hook up your rigid endoscope and a light source to this device, this one it, um, allows you basically to do that same concept where you're able to check what your endoscope picture looks like in the OR, but here we're bringing it to you at your prep and pack station. Hopefully what you're gonna see is all those brilliant colors. You're gonna be able to get a nice sharp image and that's what we want to see, of course. On a, on a new scope, that's probably what you're going to see. Hopefully, that will continue as long as your care and handling and quality program are up to snuff, right? But this, what you see now, is what you might see if there is damage to the fiber optics or the little uh, light, uh, the little crystals inside and all of that. If there's bending and breaking at the end or in the middle and all those places in between, your picture's not gonna look so good, right? So what about the light cables? Those are an important part as well. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, yep. Uh, we wanna take a look a little bit into the IFU of a, just a common fiber optic light cable because this is an important uh, quality control aspect, right? Uh, but right here you have two things that I'd like to uh, kind of point out. It specifically says to test the device function prior to use. If there's a sign of malfunction, the device should not be used and returned to Stryker for repair and evaluation. Did you know that was there? Do you do that at your facility? If you're honest with yourselves, I'm, I'm guessing that the answer is probably no, because I can say we didn't do it. <laughs> we didn't do it either. And we don't see this very often. Uh, but what about Part number seven, right? Do not abuse, pull, stretch, kink, or whatever. Well, we've so shown you pictures, and you're probably going to see more too in the next slide. Go ahead. Um, of how these things look in the real world, whether it's from the OR or if we're doing this in SPD, but this is how we receive them a lot of times, right? And it's unfortunate, but this is, you know, especially with the sheath on these light cords in, in particular. Uh, they're not they're not see-through, they're not transparent. So even if we check them, we're only gonna have a small spot to check them uh, for their integrity anyway. So what do we want to see them look like? Uh, we wanna see this damage prevented. Return, send and return these light cords and cameras in a way that you see here on the slides, right? In the containers that we sent them with and back in those containers, nice the way they should be. One important part about that, how they're returned, if you're an SPD, oh, I have no control over how they return them to me. Actually, you do. Uh, I, I would submit to you that you can do quality reporting on their performance, uh, audit their case carts, audit how they do it, report up to the OR manager, report up to the OR director, all of those things that can be done. And you can drive quality on how they're returning these devices. So this slide here, it shows you how a portable light uh, a cord adapter and a light source can help you to do a quick quality check on your light cable. See that light that's popping out of the side of the cable? 
that's the what we don't want to see we that is showing us that there are broken fibers in that light cable and it's not the light's not going where it's supposed to uh, which is to the end of the cable which is where uh, the pointer is now so we want to make sure uh, and do a quick quality check with something simple like this to make sure that cord is is intact before we send it to the operating room and what about those monopolar and bipolar cords that uh, Seth and Jahan touched on? I will tell you those pictures of the severed ones that were burnt, that's real. I, and I actually lived that in the operating room. I've seen them uh, spark and break and right in the middle of a procedure. It is pretty scary. Uh, thankfully, the ones that I had experience with, no harm occurred, no fire started, but you could definitely see how that could really go wrong. Um, but look at this picture. This is the kind of stuff that can happen in a normal department with everyday stuff going on. Hey, it got wrapped up in the washer. That looks pretty bad, but what if somebody took it out, put, set it aside and it, you know, the memory from before it kind of uncoiled or whatever and it got put back into rotation. I think it's pretty safe to say this wouldn't pass maybe a continuity test or even an insulation test. Uh, but at least if you have those things, you could test it. You could make sure that the quality of that cord is there. And that's what this uh, picture is showing us. We have a continuity tester here. Basically, this is showing that that conductive material on the inside of your cord is in fact working. That's the monopolar side. And it, you see that green light, it's, it's a good circuit that's there. And that's the bipolar side, right? So we can test both types of cords. We can make sure that that inside condu conductive material is intact and isn't gonna lead to arcing and all that stuff inside. But the other component is that insulation. Are we doing insulation testing? One of the things that I uh, commonly see is that there are facilities now that are taking insulation testing very seriously and they're testing their instruments very very carefully um, but what gets missed are these cords and to Jahan's point earlier there isn't a whole lot of guidance on how many times these things can be used I, the ones that I remember from my facility said at least a hundred times that's a lot and of course we weren't even tracking that anyway so what do we need to do we need to test for that continuity and that insulation. So make sure your insulation tester can test those cords. So why do we wanna do that, right? Um, these are just mod reports from the FDA. These are real reports of safety hazards. A female patient had an electric arc or unintended electrical stray near the wall of her small intestine during a procedure that caused the patient to have peritonitis with fluid in the peritoneum, all of that additional surgery even. And this is stuff that cannot happen. And, and part of this could be avoided if we were doing these quality checks in our department before it gets to the operating room. Here's another one. A surgeon was cauterizing underneath a patient's tongue and the forceps arced and burnt the patient's lip. That could lead to more cosmetic surgery down the line or who, who knows, right? Uh, there's another one where the surgeon claim the electrical energy from the permanent cautery hook instrument caused a thermal injury on the patient's bowel. All right, these are all very potentially serious complications. So make sure that you have a robust quality management system in place because our devices are getting more complex, more difficult to process, and uh, we know it we've we've lived it ourselves and that's why we're sharing all of this information with you we want to make sure that we're always doing it right when when people are looking right as mark twain said here uh but we also this was a a, a motto of ours in my department was quality is doing uh doing it right when nobody is looking which is what henry ford said and uh to be honest uh i can't think of anything that that really uh really can explain SPD much more than that. Nobody's looking at SPD, although I think they need to, it doesn't happen. We're usually in the basement, nobody's paying attention until things go wrong. So let's make sure we're doing uh, our best to give quality safe products back to the OR and um, 
and that's it. I mean, that's that's a wrap. What do you think, guys? Did I cover the rest? Did a great job. Yeah. I think we made Thank it just in time. <laughs> <laughs> we sure did, and I appreciate uh, such a great presentation. That was really, really well put together. Thank you, guys. Um, we are out of time for today, so I do thank um, each of you for the, the presentation. And to our audience, um, any questions that have come in, please know that those will go to um, the presenters so that they can answer those for you directly. As a um, reminder to our audience, you can obtain your continuing education certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. This survey will be emailed to you one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one continuing education credit. If you have any questions about the continuing education, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Thank you again to Jahan, Kevin, and Seth for your time today and for a great presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit our sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit hmark.com. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.